as a double protected cap. It is highly unlikely that water can spill out from my bottle. Hi guys, it's Tim from the TOEFL Bank content team. In the TOEFL listening section, taking notes is the key to getting a high score. Unless you have exceptionally good memory, you will have to rely on your notes a lot. So today, I'm going to go over the whole note-taking process in the TOEFL listening section. I will give you some tips and show you how I take notes. So let's get right into it. First, let me tell you about what you are given to take notes. When you enter the test center and sit on your designated seat, you will be presented with a couple of pencils and some paper. The number of pencils and paper you first get may vary depending on the test center, but generally you get two to three pencils and three to four sheets of paper. Also, when you're solving the listening section, you might find yourself in need of more paper or a new pencil. If you need more, don't panic. Just calmly raise your hand and the staff will come to your assistance. Okay, now here are some note-taking advice for the listening section. The first one is that you don't have to take your notes completely in English. For certain keywords and phrases that you find hard to take down in English, you can use your native language. Let's say that you heard the sentence, I went to my house to get my essay. You can take notes like this, I go house, get essay. But for example, let's say that you forgot how to spell the word house in English. In this case, you can write house in your native language. Since I'm Korean, I could write the sentence down like this. I go cheap, get essay. Also, if you're taking the TOEFL Home Edition with all of this pandemic going around, you might have to take notes on an erasable surface, not paper, such as a whiteboard. But still, don't worry because these tips and advice apply to both paper and erasable surfaces. The second tip is to use symbols and abbreviations. Symbols are marks or signs that represent something specific. So back to the sentence, I went to my house to get my essay, you could take notes like this. This symbol represents the word house. Abbreviations are words and phrases that are shortened. For example, you may have seen them on calendars where the month November is abbreviated as this. Symbols and abbreviations are really important when taking notes, not just in the listening section, but also in the speaking and writing integrated tasks where you have to listen to conversations or lectures. Symbols allow you to save time. Instead of spelling out the long words, you can replace those with shorter versions of those words, which would be symbols or abbreviations. For example, if the word photosynthesis is too long or difficult for you to write, you can use the symbol P to replace the whole word. However, some might have difficulties relating the letter P with the word photosynthesis. So you can just write photosynthesis equals P. And the next time photosynthesis comes out in the lecture, you can write P every time that word comes out. I'll give you a couple of examples of symbols. You can use a plus sign to replace the phrase I agree and a negative sign as the opposite. You can use this abbreviation E slash C to replace the long word because and so on. An important thing here you guys should know is that symbols and abbreviations don't follow a universal rule. You can make these up however you like. Use symbols that you're really comfortable with. For example, I use the plus sign to replace the expression I agree, but some of you guys can use this to replace the phrase in addition. Okay, so the last tip is not directly about how to take notes, but it's about what to look out for when listening to conversations and lectures. It's really important to listen for words and phrases such as but, on the other hand, in addition, and for example, because these words or phrases signal you that something important is about to come up. For example, let's say that there is a conversation between a student and a librarian. They're talking about why the student cannot use the library. The librarian will say, first, there is a huge leak in one of the pipes, so we're trying to fix that. But then she proceeds by saying, in addition, the library was already planned for a renovation, so we're doing that too. Here, you would have to listen carefully to words or phrases like first and in addition, because the information that comes after those words and phrases may be the key to solving the questions later on. 
So if a question such as why can't a student use the library comes out, you can use the information that came up after those words and phrases. So with the tips and advice I gave you, let me show you how I take notes in the listening section. Those who want to practice with me are welcome to. Pause the video, bring a piece of paper and a pencil, and resume the video. Listen to a conversation between a student and a librarian. Excuse me, you really can't be drinking water in the library. You're kidding. I thought drinks were allowed as long as they were kept in bottles. The last time I came here, they said nothing to me when I had my water bottle out on the table. I've even seen people drink coffee here. First of all, coffee is definitely not allowed in the library. It was never allowed in the first place. As for water, it used to be allowed under the circumstances that they were kept in sealed bottles. But just last week, we had an incident when a student spilled water all over the table, damaging the library books and archived materials. Since then, the policies have changed, prohibiting eating and drinking in the library whatsoever. But you see, my bottle is firmly sealed. Look, it even has a double protected cap. It is highly unlikely that water can spill out from my bottle. I understand that the chances aren't likely, but still, policies are policies, and we can't take the smallest risk that can damage library property. I'm going to have to ask you to either put away your water bottle or leave. As you can see, I drew a line in the middle of the paper because this helps me to organize my note taking. In the left side, I took down the notes what the student said, and on the right side, I took down what the librarian says. So let's take a look. So at first, the librarian says H2O no, which means you can't drink water. So instead of writing water, I just felt comfortable with writing H2O. So when the student says, you're kidding, I just replaced that with a question mark. First of all, drinking coffee wasn't allowed in the first place. I just replaced not allowed with X's. And here's a fun thing. I used a triangle to replace the phrase or word, but or on the other hand, because that's why I, that's what I use. And I put an arrow uh, below week so to represent last week. Another helpful tip. And uh, yeah, that's basically it. So let's move on to the lecture. Anyway, after the caterpillar stage, they form a pupal stage. Butterflies form into chrysalis and moths as cocoons. The two species are also different in the way they form the stage. First, the butterfly larva will harden with its own skin. The moth larva will use exterior materials for protection. Now, exterior materials here include literally anything such as leaves or even paper. So this stage also provides us another obvious characteristic to discover what a pupa would hatch into. Okay, so the lecture you just heard was about how to distinguish moths and butterflies based on their characteristics. So right off the bat, let's take out the note taking I did. So I used the letter C to replace the word caterpillar because it's too long, right? And I used the letter M to replace the word moth. And I used arrows to connect the ideas related to it. So B for butterflies. So the larva hardens itself with its own skin. And for M, uh, pupa of the moths uh, hardens their skin with exterior materials such as leaves and paper. And I used another arrow below that to represent that it's a more specific explanation. So yeah, that's how I took notes for this lecture. Before I finish off this video, I want to tell you guys that taking notes is something that you have to be comfortable with. In this video, I showed you a couple of examples of how I take notes. However, you don't have to do exactly what I did. Note taking should be personalized to each and every one of you. Find what you're most comfortable with. 
Thank you all to those who watched this until the end. I really hope this helped those who are preparing for the TOEFL. You guys are the best, and we wish you luck on your next exam. Make sure to subscribe and like the video.